and welcome to our talk about the lifetime safety profile and the implementation that we did in Clang for this. I am Matthias Gera. I work at Selexica. We are a company that does C++ tooling around static analysis combined with instrumentation and profiling. And uh, I'm Gabor Horvath, a PhD student located in Hungary. But this summer I was interning at Microsoft and my employer was kind enough letting me work on Clang. Okay, so in this talk, we will summarize what are some of the differences between the current implementation that we have and the paper that we pursue. And we will talk about how this analysis works when we do not consider uh, how the functions interact with each other. And later on, we will elaborate on this case. After that, we will give you some update about the current status and what's, what can you expect in the near future. We will also reflect on some of the examples that we saw on Reddit and other social media that are not working yet. And we will discuss whether these are implementation artifacts or something that needs to be addressed in the paper. So let's start with paper versus implementation. Mm, who of you was in the plenary? Who of you wasn't? Okay, like one person. So you probably have heard about the paper because Herb just talked about it. It has been uploaded roughly a week ago on the C++ core guidelines repo, which, mm, I mean, there was a draft paper before that I think three years ago that he spoke about at CppCon 2015. And one week ago, he up uploaded version 1.0. And yeah, it tries to find the most commonly, uh, common uh, sources of dangling and diagnose them. It's not catching all possible bugs. He mentioned in the keynote that the focus was shifted away from being like uh, the closed framework in that sense. And yeah, watch his plenary talk if you didn't already because that will explain and motivate a lot of things. If you're still wondering afterwards why this is even important, also watch Jason Turner's talk about surprises and object lifetime, because that's also the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, the Clang-based implementation, it's alpha status, which basically started eight weeks ago, and that's a bit of a funny story. I mean, actually it started three years ago because I was doing Clang Tidy at the time, and then the TPPCon conference came, and Herb did this awesome plenary about lifetime and how we could fix those problems. And I was looking into doing some project with Clang Tidy to get me more into that ecosystem. I thought, oh, that would be an awesome toy project. Turned out to be not a toy project. But I worked a bit on it, and I got as far as like diagnosing the very first example that Herb showed in his plenary, like where you have a local variable i, and it goes out of scope and then you see it dangling, but it didn't go any further. And then due to time constraints and something, I dropped it, I didn't work on it anymore. And exactly eight weeks ago to this day, I received a funny email with the subject lifetime update. And it, I think, okay, what does it mean lifetime update? Did I just inherit $1 million and I just need to give someone 1,000 euros? And it turns out the sender of that email was Herb Sutter, which I've never talked to before. And I was, okay, maybe I should read it. And he was announcing that the paper that he had in draft three years ago was going to be updated, that he had a, a pre-4 version to the 1.0. And if we were interested in doing the implementation for CppCon, so we had some, something to show. And yeah, it was just eight weeks and I have a full-time job. So, okay, could be possible. But then there was also Gabor. So we worked together on this and did what we could. There's still a lot of cases that don't work because of time constraints and whatever, but we'll try to point out if this is due to where the implementation currently is and can be fixed, or if this due to the approach which does not intend to catch all, common, all sources, only the common ones. Oh, yes, there's an MSVC-based implementation too, which we don't cover in this talk. It was started by Neil McIntosh and then continued by Kyle Reitz. And we want to especially thank Kyle because during our implementation, we talked a lot with Kyle about what he did, what we did, how we understood the paper. 
it's always good to have two implementation of the same thing because you also see what, what's clear, what's not so clear. So that really helped us a lot. Okay, so let's move uh, into some examples with intrafunction analysis. So this is a very basic example, maybe a very similar one or even the same one was uh, showcased at the plenary. Here we have a pointer P which is initially null. Instead of having these annotations with comments, we have some debug facilities that can dump the internal state of the analysis so we can see how this progresses. And in a smaller scope, we have a local variable i. And after pointing p to i, we have the correct p set points to set for the pointer p and later on when we leave the scope of i we have a dangling pointer and if we try to dereference the dangling pointer we will see an error just as Herb told us the error is when we dereference the dangling pointer having a dangling pointer is okay just we not supposed to use it in certain ways if we look at the second example it might be somewhat familiar to the first one. We have a vector in a smaller scope and we have an iterator that points into the vector. So the iterator is not pointing at the vector, but it's pointing into the buffer that is owned by the vector. And uh, this is uh, displayed using this V prime notation. So the prime here means that we point into that vector. And after the vector was destroyed, we have a dangling iterator. And if we would like to uh, deref this dangling iterator, we will see a warning. At this point, maybe it gets a little bit boring because we have yet another example with string view, but exactly the same thing is going on. So the question is if we can reason about the first piece of code. Why couldn't we reason about the same way about the next two functions? And this is exactly what this analysis is doing. So let's skip to the last example. Here we have a vector and then an iterator that is pointing into that vector. And we can see that the points to set of the iterator is into the vector and the points to set of the vector is also into the vector because the vector owns its own memory and it is always pointing into its own memory. And if we push back a value into this vector, the vector still points to its own memory, but the vector has been evaluated, so the iterator that used to point to the old buffer and still points to the old buffer is potentially dangling, so we will uh, issue a warning when we next dereference this vector. Some backup screenshots. Okay, so uh, as you saw, we have some debugging, debugging facilities for this analysis. And the reason we want to highlight it, because if you start to play around with this and find some bugs, and you annotate your functions with these uh, debugging facilities, it makes the bug reports much harder to understand for us. And maybe it also can help you understand why the analysis thinks that a pointer dangles in case the, there is a true positive result, but uh, it is not apparent, apparent uh, what the underlying reason is. So there is a hidden message to this. We glad to receive bug reports. So if anyone has some code that is not working and it, it would be, and you would expect it to work, let's open an issue at uh, the GitHub page. Okay, so let's talk about the approach a bit. So we classify types to certain categories. So we have owners similar to vector or unique pointer. We have pointers, which are the generalization of the row pointer. So std reference wrapper, you might 
remember this uh, example from the keynote is one example of that. We have aggregates, and these aggregates are not the same aggregate that is in the C++ standard. It's a slightly different concept. And we have values which are none of the ones above. So let's look into owners. Owners own their memory. They should never dangle. They always point to their own memory, but the ownership might be transferred. So we might move an owner into another one, and that should be reflected in the analysis state. They might be invalidated. In this case, the owner itself, of course, still valid, but the pointers that points into the owners, they, they are the ones who will be invalidated. And also, we do not try to check owners because uh, they tend to have very tricky semantics that are hard to reason about. And other approaches, for example, Rust is doing the same in this, in this sense because most of the time if you implement something non-trivial in, in Rust, you need to use unsafe code, but you of course encapsulate, it, encapsulate that behind a safe API. And in our model, currently, we need to know what the owned type is. For example, a unique pointer to an integer, the owned type is an integer. Pointers do not own their memory, and for this reason, they might dangle. They can have a generalized null state that we would not like to dereference. And they might point into owners. And for pointers, we keep track of the points to sets, so the set of objects that this pointer might point at. And similarly to owners, we need to know what the pointed type is. Aggregates are similar to plain old data types. They have no user written copy, move, or destruct operations, and we usually handle them member-wise. Uh, values are basically everything else, and uh, with this analysis, we try to respect the encapsulations you already have. So what this means, we have a different rigor to validate private members of a class than public ones, because they are not part of the public API, and uh, we cannot know the invariants you have. So let's put some more formality into what p-sets and p-maps are and how the analysis works. We already touched this, the analysis is local, so we analyze one function at a time to be able to keep the effort down. And what happens in the Clang implementation is basically you build some abstract syntax tree. So you have your expressions passed, and then you get something that is a control flow graph, which is kind of, if you don't know, like high-level C++ assembly. It tells you which operations happen after each other. So first I takes, I get some values, then I do an add, then I put them to a function, I get a return value of a function, I put it into uh, some integer or whatever. And all those things after another, they get analyzed step by step. And for each step, we will see of the, if those expressions have an effect of the P set of a certain object. And for all the variables that we have, we track their P sets in the P map, which maps variables to P sets. So P set can contain various things. And one of them is invalid. That already happens if you just declare like a raw pointer and don't initialize it, then it starts invalid. And we saw other cases of invalid already. A raw pointer or other generalized pointers can also be null by assigning null pointer, for example. Um, they can be contain, the P set can contain a thing that we call static, and that basically means the lifetime of the point two object is so long that we don't really care what it is. So for example, if you take the address of a global, you don't need to track anymore if that gets invalidated because that never happens. And it's also kind of a fallback if the analysis gets to its boundaries, then we say, okay, static, and there's no diagnostics with statics because it cannot be invalidated. And then it can point at variables so just taking the address of a variable makes the pointer point to that variable. And that also includes parameters. And as Gabor mentioned, there we handle aggregates like transparently. So if you have a local variable that is an aggregate type, we handle it as if all the members were local variables. 
and the same for parameters. We expand them as if you pass all those members. And the last category of what a PSET can contain is it can point into owners. And that's the prime thing that you see. And there are also primes over primes. If you have like a vector of a vector of unique pointers, then you can point into that owner, into that owner, into that owner, so you get multiple primes. All of that what I mentioned was getting P sets that are single elements. But you can also get like P sets with multiple elements. And the main way to do that is via branching. We see here we have a pointer P and we have a condition and in the branches we do different things. But of course we don't want to do like control flow sensitive analysis and tracking exactly how those things happen because that quickly explodes. Just think about a loop, you would need to like unroll every iteration and track closely what happens. So what we do is we have a piece set before that if, so before the control flow graph forks, and that becomes the entry piece set of both the then block and the else block. And then inside those blocks, we update the piece set separately. And after the complete if statement, those are merged. So after the if statement, we don't exactly know where P points at, but we know it must be either I or now. And that's good enough for the analysis, because then if you do re reference it, we will say, ah, that's possible now, you shouldn't do that. And yeah, you might reason, okay, in this case I have here, it's not really now, but can your coworkers also reason that far? Maybe it's easier to write the code in a way that it's obvious if it's now or not now. And so we will just summarize what we just said with a simple vector example. So we have two vectors here, and we take an iterator into V1. So the P set of the iterator is V1 prime, prime meaning points in two. And then we have an if statement, and in the if statement, we change the iterator to point into V2. So inside the if statement, the P set of this iterator is V2 prime. And then we have this hidden else branch that we don't see. And we do the merging. And so what the piece of uh, the iterator becomes is V1 prime or V2 prime. I mean, it kind of happens what obviously should happen. And then when you invalidate one of the vectors and you dereference the iterator, it will say, ha, ah, that doesn't look safe because it might point to that vector that just got validated. OK. so. A similar aspect that we support in this analysis is null checking. And what is really wonderful about null tracking is basically it is using the same concepts that you learned already use, using the previous slides. So if we have a branch and, we, and the condition of the branch is a null check, then on, for the then branch, in this case, we will propagate the P set that doesn't contain the null value. And on the else branch, we will propagate a P set that contains only one value, the null. And the reason why this works is because after the branch instruction, when we merge the then and the else branch, we will merge the states. So we'll, we will get back both the state where we have the null value and the state where we don't. So this way, we will get the correct null tracking. Of course, this is a very simple example. And usually, in our source code, uh, we have more complicated conditions. So let's look at one example. If we have an AND in the check, and in this case, we could rewrite this code using two separate branches. And when the compiler builds the control flow graph for this expression, that control flow graph already respects this. So it, it is almost as if it was rewritten in terms of simpler branches. And if we propagating these states the way I just described along these branches and do the merges at the merge points, it turns out it will work for it will work pretty much for every language construct. So this way we are using very simple ideas and it will in combination, they will give the expected results. What about ternary operators? Does that also work? Yes, of course. Those are also represented with similar CFGs. 
Perfect. So, interfunction analysis. Now it becomes really interesting because you need to reason across boundaries that you don't uh, look at anymore. So let's have a little motivating example. We have some f, we have an integer, we have a foo. It takes this integer and another parameter and it returns a reference. Might look familiar. So question is, what is r? Is it valid? Is it invalid? Can we know by looking at the call side? Depends. If we have a foo that looks like this, then it's basically a plus equals operator. And everything is awesome because we'll just return a reference to the first argument. That's i, that's can, that doesn't dangle. So everything is good. But if we have the min that we already saw, things go south. And that makes it really hard to look at the call side and understand should that be, is it an error? Is it not an error? So if even we don't understand what's going on, how can the compiler do that? And that's a little detour. Okay, so how type safety works? Uh, if we do not have any type checking, then if we pass an argument to a function with the wrong type, we might get either a runtime error or some other unexpected behavior, like, like the wrong answer. So in this world without type safety, we have very little guarantees and there is a lot of way to make errors. And uh, people realized this pretty early in the history of programming languages that having types can help us uh, write better code. So how type systems work? We need to annotate our functions and we would need to have a clear interface. So with this clear interface, the compiler can check at the call site if the types of the arguments are okay. And if the type of the argument is not okay, the compiler can either insert a conversion or make it a compile time error. And this way we will not have runtime errors. And in the callee, the compiler can check if the result that we are going to provide also has the right type. So basically using these annotations, we can reason about the code locally and have some property and uh, prove some properties about the code globally. And notice that type systems are not perfect in a sense that they also have false positives and true negatives. Not all the well-typed programs are correct and not all the correct programs are well-typed. So basically, even though uh, a program being well-typed is not a guarantee for that program to be correct, still, I think since we are C++ programmers, everybody see the value of writing or working with well-typed programs. So sometimes we might even invest uh, time into making a program that is not uh, well-typed and uh, refactoring it into a more type-safe solution. For example, getting rid of void pointers in a code base. So usually when we have a code that is not uh, well-typed and correct, we have a way to rewrite that code in a way that is, it is still correct, but also well-typed. So that's our solution. Well, you just go to all your code that you have ever written and on every function you annotate lifetimes and then it will be good. We will check that, it will be awesome. It will look roughly like this. So for the first few, you say, okay, the lifetime of what's returned, it's a lifetime of A. So it's basically same points to set. And for the second one, you will say, yeah, the lifetime of what's returned is A or B. We don't really know, it depends on what the function does. And with this information on the interface, you don't need the body anymore and you can check in the call side. Is this a valid thing, what I get back or not? But of course not. I mean, <laughs> that would make no sense, huh? No one would, would do that. It's so, a fallback. Huh? It's a good fallback. <coughs> yeah, it's a fallback. And our analysis basically works around, I mean, it has this notion of having those annotations, but mostly implicitly, and having heuristics that go there. Yes, uh, we forget to mention if anybody has any comments or questions, feel free to interrupt us. Please. Uh, so do you have any data on how often functions return things whose lifetime is bound to their arguments? Like how often do you annotate functions that you have and take them back? 
Are you asking if the heuristics are good? Uh, oh, the so question so was how often do we... How often would you need these annotations? Suppose we didn't have the heuristics, right? Yeah, so repeat the question. Yes. Okay, so the question was, how often do we need these annotations? Um, no, the, the question is, if you didn't have any heuristics at all, mm -hmm. um, how often would you need annotations? Do you have any data on how often you would need annotations? Like, how often do functions return references that point into their arguments? Because in my experience, that's really quite rare. Um, and so suggesting this is going to be incredibly common, I'm not sure that that works. Okay, so since uh, this implementation started eight weeks ago, we do not have uh, much experience on uh, how often it is the case, but uh, if we, so later in this talk, we will have some other examples. So it is not only the, so the, not, we do not assume that we will return exactly one of the arguments. We have some more sophisticated methods, but of course, uh, in case this heuristics do not work out for your code, you need to add the annotations. Can you, when you're analyzing the body of a function, can you tell whether or not the annotation on the function matches the computed lifetime of the return value? Yes, that's definitely something that we do, because otherwise the interface contract would be just one-sided. And we want to check this at call site and in the implementation to make sure that the annotations actually match, especially if we use heuristics, because then the annotations are implicit and it would be easy to get them wrong at either side. So yes, the intention is also to check them inside the body. And it's a report if you disagree. Yes. Okay, so for the recording, the question was uh, whether we validate the annotations when we check the function body, and the answer was yes. Thank you. So yeah, let's go on. Quick survey. Sorry, yes, one more question. Is there a clan tidy plugin plan that automatically fills in the annotations? So the question was if there's a clan tidy plugin that fills in annotations, and the answer is no, and I wouldn't suppose it would be useful because either those annotations are like automatic. Ah, you mean by analyzing the function body? Yes. Because that would make sense. Headers, right? Yes, that would totally make sense. There's nothing planned, but now that you say it, we should consider that. Okay, back to the survey. Let's look at some functions. You have them in your code base. You have an API. It is just received. <laughs> you don't need the. You don't know what the bodies look like, and there is some documentation what the functions do. Imagine some nice names, but it's not super detailed about lifetimes like always. So what, is, what would you imagine is the contract on that function if the documentation doesn't say this? For example, for F1, who here in the audience thinks that it would be okay to uh, pass a dangling pointer to F1? That's zero people. Makes sense. I mean, makes never sense to have a dangling pointer to a function because a function cannot check that's dangling. Who thinks that it's okay to pass a null pointer to F1? said a bit more than half, I would think, like 60%. Okay. If we look at F2, so we have some struct and a pointer to a pointer. Who would think this is a pure in parameter? Like two persons. Who would think this is an in and out parameter? It's a bit more, like half. Who thinks this is an out only parameter? That's another two persons. Okay, uh, yeah, string view by reference. Who thinks? <laughs> okay, quickly, who thinks in parameter? No one. Who thinks in out parameter? Like everyone. Who thinks out parameter? Like two people. Okay. Trick question F4. What do you think is the lifetime of the returned reference? Any ideas? Singleton. Okay. And <laughs> yes, those should be all comments in code review, huh? Don't name your function like this. <laughs> <laughs> and F5. So this is a bit more complex. We have some const char return. We have a string and a const string input. 
What do you think the return value should point at? The options are S or T or S and T, we don't really know. So who's in favor of S? One, at two, three. That's dangerous. Huh? That's least dangerous. Okay, five people, less dangerous. Who think it's just T? One person hiding behind his chair, two. And then who thinks it will probably be pointing at S or T, we don't know. Okay, that's almost everyone. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who wins. We have some heuristics, but we are tuning them. I just wanted to see what you think. Yeah, that's the main motivation for it would be more safe if it just points at S. But yeah, it depends. You can annotate it either way. So the current paper version of the heuristics looks like this. Um, so just just one note that uh, there are no good or wrong answers. We try we to betray. test what the usual expectations of a developer is when looking at the API. So this is something that the analysis tries to reconstruct. So the idea is whenever something more surprising is going on and not what most of us would expect, then having an annotation would make the code clearer. And so it, it wouldn't just aid the analysis itself, but also anyone who is uh, working with that API. Exactly. So that's what the current table looks like in the paper. And it's basically saying, if you pass values, we assume them to be valid. You should be passing valid values, which is easy. You should not pass move from values, but generally, like most of the values are valid anyways. And then if you pass a pointer, then of course that should be valid or now. It can be now. We, we think by default, yeah, you can pass now. If not, pass a reference. And then we have this pointer to pointer. And that we classify as output only parameter. So it means you need to put something valid on top level, but the DREF does not need to be valid on call. You can assume that it is valid when you return. And then you have this reference to pointer, and that we classify as in out, so string view. You need to pass something valid in, something valid will come out. It might be something different than you passed in, but it will have also valid on our semantics. Exactly, and with those classifications of inputs and outputs, the whole function analysis basically works. We look at what's our inputs, what's our outputs. Outputs can be parameters like this. They also return value. And then we do type matching based on what owners and pointers uh, contain. Like Gabor mentioned, for all owners and pointers, we know what the contain type is. Vector of int contains int, an iterator, a vector of int iterator also points to int. And based on those types, we do matching to find out, okay, which outputs can be derived from which inputs. And then by default, we take the set of matching things. And we prefer to do non-const references to owners because, yeah, you saw, they are unsafe sometimes. They can easily bind to temporaries. So if we have something with a correct type that's not const reference, we take that one and ignore the const reference one unless you annotate. But if we only have const reference ones here, then we take those. And uh, also, if we find out that one of these assumption is not correct, we can change the defaults and analysis would still work. Okay, so let's go to the next example. So yeah, that's basically showcasing what I just said. We have a find function at the top, which takes a vector of strings and a haystack and some const string needle reference. And then we will call it from f. We first build a local vector of string and we can use our debugging facilities to actually make sure that we deduce the right thing types. So it will tell us, okay, vector of string, we deduce it to be an owner and we say what it contains is strings. Makes sense. And you can do like easy things. You can call a begin on the vector. And then, okay, you don't see arguments right now, but there is a this pointer. Huh? So this pointer has a right deref type, 
the same as the uh, return type because the iterator points to strings, the vector contains strings, so we say, okay, what you get out is probably derived from this. So we will see the iterator points to this. And yes, the iterator category matches that. <coughs> you can do things like find if and pass in iterators and get an iterator out and by type matching, you will see, yeah, it makes what you expect it to do. And you can also call our now self-defined find, which we saw above, which takes this vector of string reference and const string references. And here the rule comes to play that we prefer non-const references because they bind to temporaries. So in that case, with the custom find function, the heuristic will say the returned value is derived from a haystack and not from needle because we try to avoid those temporaries if we can. You could annotate it otherwise, but that's a default. And now there's some yeah, made-up example for output parameters. It's looked like a C-style find. So we have some car star pointer pointer and it will put in like the start of the string that it found, if it found one. If it didn't, it returns false. And there you will see, okay, we can declare this uh, local pos thing and it will be invalid because we didn't initialize it, but we can still pass it to this find C function because we classify the parameters out. So we don't require it to be valid when passed in. And we require it to be valid when passed out. And we will see from the arguments, okay, this is an output parameter, where could it come from? And do the uh, deriving. And things happen like we would expect them to happen. Okay, so let's look at the current status. Uh, for example, what's the performance of the analysis is. So the measurements we did, uh, we took some of the bigger translation units on, of Clang and we ran the analysis over it using a release build without assertions and with the lifetimes patch included. And uh, because the Clang code base wasn't written with uh, the set of guidelines in mind that uh, this analysis would require, we would see a lot of warnings and IO would be most of our time. So in order to do this measurement, we turned off the actual reporting of the warnings. So this is closer to a real world use case when the code base is already uh, somewhat clean of these errors. And what we found out is that uh, if we have code gen, so we actually generating object files, in that case, the overhead is less than 5%. If we are only doing syntactic checks, then uh, it's slightly more proportionally, but uh, that's still manageable in our opinion. And it's without optimizations yet. We spend most of the time implementing stuff. so. There's a lot of code when you look at it and say, ah, that should be written differently. And yes, that's true. And it, I hope it will also help with performance. Mm, yes, so what we did is we made all those basic examples work that you saw during the plenary and during the talk. So basic intra function analysis, basic inter function analysis, deriving pointers from arguments and stuff. <coughs> but there are chapters in the paper that we didn't implement yet. So what we, for example, don't have is exceptions. They are basically handled like a branch. So we have this branch handling and exceptions would kind of flow in there. You will see a branch from every exception throwing statement into the catch block. That would be something that we need to do in the CFG. Mm, aggregates, yes, we said they should be expanded, like completed transplant, as if you wrote the variables directly there, either in parameter lists or as a local variable but that's not there yet. And use after move detection. Yes, so we don't currently track the p sets of values which we need to do to see, okay, after a move, this thing became invalid. All the pointers that pointed here are pointed are there. It's not a big change, but yeah, it's not there yet. And we actually don't have annotations yet. So all the code we did was with the heuristics, and that's nice. We have one annotation actually. You can mark things lifetime const so that they don't invalidate owners. But we don't have the other annotations yet. And I think we also don't actually have them 
defined to the end yet, how the annotation should look like, where they should be put, and there will be ongoing work. Some credits to Kyle and uh, MSVC implementation. He already implemented aggregates and use after move support. So uh, in some sense, uh, MSVC is ahead of the Clang implementation. We have null checks. OK, anyways. Yes, so there was this blog post by Herb about announcing the paper, and there was also a Reddit thread from that, and there were people posting samples, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, and we want to go over them quickly and look, is this because the implementation is not far enough, or is this because the paper will never be able to handle this kind of things? And we want to comment on those quickly. So this was like one of the first ones, and it's basically building a lambda in the function above, and it captures by reference, super implicitly, because yeah, you just put an ampersand and things happen. And it captures the parameter n, but that will be completely gone once you evaluate it in the caller. So we don't diagnose this currently, and the question is, will we eventually? The answer is yes, because the paper already says if you have lambdas and those captures, then the lambda basically becomes like a pointer pointing to those captures. And then when we return them, we can check the pset, see, okay, all those things in the pset got invalidated because I'm about to leave the function, and this will be diagnosed. Okay, so this was another example, which is a bit convoluted. So uh, here the argument was that uh, each time we set p the pointer p to null pointer, later on we will end up setting p to something else. So actually the referencing the pointer p at the beginning of the loop is safe, but uh, this kind of tricky code is not easy to reason about, especially since the condition is a global that could be changed anytime. So this is particularly error-prone. So one of the assumptions that this kind of analysis have is that uh, every pass is feasible. So it tries not to reason about whether we can or cannot take a certain branch. We will just take it and, and uh, propagate the analysis state as if uh, every branch is possible. So the question is, uh, how comfortable are we having tricky code like this? Is it okay to have a tool to warn about this? So there are some kind of false positives that are certainly okay to have, in my opinion. Of course, having that said, uh, we did try to use this analysis on some real world code bases and uh, our experience so far is that it's better to build the project with this in mind from scratch because applying it afterwards for a large code base that are not following uh, these guidelines is hard or can be hard. I mean, it comes mostly down to heuristics. Maybe we will get switches turning heuristics back and forth for different code bases. <coughs> I don't know. Let's see. Tuning will come. So there's another example that we have. It's an array. And we declare it, we put some element in there and now, and then we dereference it. So actually nothing bad should happen. We just look at the array thing. There's no dangling. We still warn. Why is that? That's uh, yeah, a bug, I think. It was also a bug in the paper. Was it? I think, yeah, because the origin of this is because we miscategorized the array. We think it's the pointer but actually it's an aggregate. And you should just take the array out of it and say, okay, that's the array, you point to the array, nothing bad can happen. So we uh, diagnose here because it's an aggregate, but we discussed this like three days ago and we fixed stuff. So now it will be categorized as an aggregate and an upcoming implementation change, and then that warning will go away. Okay, so I think this is an example that is similar to one that was presented in Jason's talk. And, uh, well, so let's make it a quiz. 
who can see where the problem is? Right, so the explanation was that we have a function called get s, which will return a temporary, and we will call a method on this temporary, and uh, for loops, range-based for loops will extend the lifetime of temporaries, but in this case, we do not extend the lifetime of a temporary because what we iterate on basically is not itself a temporary, but is an L value reference that was returned by get. So by the end of that expression, the temporary S will go away and uh, we dangle. There is a similar code snippet that works in the current implementation. The main reason this does not work yet because we do not have aggregate support. So uh, once we have that, hopefully this example will work as intended. Yeah, the working version is if you have an, an optional of a vector and then you do optional get and iterate over it, boom. And that part is already diagnosed. So here's another example that was posted. And that's also a fun one. It's basically returning a reference to local, but by obfuscating it through a function call. And this was not diagnosed, but ha, it is, <laughs> because Matt just <laughs> updated Compiler Explorer one hour ago. <laughs> and and, and yeah. Matthias fixed it yesterday. I mean, it was just one line fix. <laughs> But yeah, now it's working. Thanks, Matt. So, okay, so, uh, well, this is what we <laughs> wanted to uh, talk about, and uh, we are very interested in any kind of feedback and any uh, bug reports, and we are also interested in having real-world experience reports uh, because uh, one, of the, one of the most important things in this analysis to gain adoption is to get the defaults right. We think we have a good set of defaults that might not be the perfect set of defaults, so uh, real-world experience certainly helps there. And, uh, so uh, all of the contributions are welcome and we are looking into upstreaming these patches at some point. They are not super big, so hopefully the LLVM community will have the resources to review them. So let's proceed with the questions. Right. The answer was very early. They're going to talk to people tomorrow. I'm very excited. Um, I'd love to be able to put this in. And if, it, if we can't have it in Clang like immediately, can we have it in Clang tidy as like an option that that can happen? Because that's because already there are millions of things that we can turn on and turn off and play with and use on existing sources as they stand. So thank you. This is brilliant. So the, the, just to extend on this, the LLVM um, project has a policy of uh, having incremental patches. So when we have a slightly bigger contributions, a lot of the time, but the process is basically almost like uh, re-implementing the functionality upstream with the help of the community and with addressing all of the review comments. So I would expect this to take quite a bit of time, but in the meantime, there is a implementation in Matthias's repository that is uh, uh, ready to go, uh, modulo bugs. So that's it, yes. Oh, thank you. There's one more note. You might notice there are two different God bolts on here. 
And yeah, that's true. There is a CPP X1, which in Godbolt is a different language, and that's basically lifetime with meta classes, what we saw in the plenary. And that's a slightly older LVM version. And then there is now also, since 12 hours, <laughs> a Godbolt in the C++ language section that says experimental dash W lifetime, and that's the version directly from the repository that we use with a more recent LVM that we will update that to become the upstreaming version. This is very nice, thank you very much. Uh, you apparently have some form of interprocedural analysis, as you mentioned, but what about analysis between different source files? Uh, do will we ever have this? So? Okay, so what we have in terms of interprocedural analysis actually stops at the declaration of the function that we call. We don't really look at different function bodies. So it makes no difference if the other function body is in the same translation unit or in another translation unit. We anyways only look at the interfaces. Hi, um, I'm from an automotive <coughs> um, So uh, when, when I saw it, like your example, with like who, who would want to write these annotations on every single function? We would. Okay. So uh, when when you're thinking about it, there are domains where uh, people are um, willing to go to very great lengths to get certain guarantees from tools, uh, much more than probably the majority of the people in this room. So uh, please please keep that in mind when, when thinking about the trade-offs here. Um, in uh, in that regard, um, I, I was noticing that uh, you were using attributes uh, for for some of the annotations. And I remember that in the uh, original proposal, it, it was <coughs> mostly relying on wrapper types uh, uh, provided by the guideline support library. Um, I was thinking that like one advantage that I could see with wrapper types is that um, I could like with a with a little bit switch uh, enable additional runtime checks, um, like as a pure library solution without needing compiler support for that. Um, which, like, to me, feels would be an argument for uh, using wrapper types in, instead of attributes. Was that something that, that you have thought about? So, we do support some wrapper types. For example, there is just there is this uh, GSL not null to mark that the pointer cannot be null. Uh, I'm not sure if there is a convenient way to uh, express. Uh, this input output binding kind of things in the end, type system. It does not have to be very convenient. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we didn't have this use case in mind yet, so uh, I, I think it might be good to talk offline about this. Thank you. Thanks. So, sorry, it might be answered a bit by a previous question, but I still wonder to clarify for myself. You initially mentioned that you uh, want to track types of the owners and of the pointers. And are these types just for like uh, heuristics and this just not null stuff? Or you're using the types in an actual one uh, analysis? They are used to understand if we should track P sets or if things can point into them like owners, pointers. They are not actually types in the type system. And usually they are completely hidden from your source code because we have heuristics that understand if something looks like a type, uh, looks like an owner, for example. If it looks like a container, it's probably an owner. If it looks like a range, it's probably a pointer. So we have heuristics for that. But there's also annotations that we already have in the implementation where you can say, OK, this class, G is L owner. And then it will be handled as an owner. Because uh, I was thinking that I might return an index in a vector from a function. I still can lifetime bound it to the third vector because it's been validated. And it's like not really like an end, an index, not a pointer, but it's still, like still gets a bit as a pointer. There's yeah. someone from the audience. If, if you mean uh, the type matching for if I take an instar and a char star and I return an instar, I assume it's the instar. That's just part of the heuristic. There's nothing in the analysis that knows anything about types other than your pointer and owner and aggregate or about. Yeah, so heuristics use types, but uh, like the language types. And the heuristics, again, are totally malleable, and their only purpose is to uh, reduce the amount of annotation by picking good defaults and 
and it's not for the announcement. I try to repeat that for the video. <laughs> so what someone from the audience said is <laughs> her, was that the types are used in the heuristics to determine input-output relationship, but they are only for the heuristics. So the analysis, analysis itself does not depend on knowing those types, and they could be overridden, and there could be different heuristics. So the example you gave of something that I think was found on Reddit that doesn't work yet of a uh, lambda that captures a reference, and you said I think that you think you can make that work, it just doesn't yet. Uh, the times that that sort of mistake has been made is always taking that lambda and putting it somewhere, and then running it on some other thread or something. Is there something about that transfer of ownership that is more difficult than the example that you gave that would make it hard to implement, or just or impossible, or is that just So, uh, I think we do not deal with this kind of concept in the paper right now, that you would save something for later use. By, so, we do not handle this kind of escapes. So, for example, if you pass, pass a lambda to a callback, uh, we will interpret that, uh, that that function that takes a callback might call the lambda immediately. So uh, I, I think this is this is a good future extension to the paper. So I, I don't see why couldn't we work in that direction. And her probably has some comments on that. You should mention, Matthias, that the example that you showed with the lambda worked two weeks ago. The reason it doesn't now is just because we're, we're just changing how we handle lambdas to be more general. And we disabled the old one, and we haven't done the new one yet. So what someone from the audience said <laughs> is that lambdas used to work two weeks ago. We restructured the analysis a bit to make it less like aggregates and more like its own thing. And that's why lambdas don't work right now. I also think that we have some kind of escape analysis in some cases. For example, if you store lambda into a global, then that thing needs to have static lifetime. Otherwise we will, otherwise we will warn you that this is not a good idea. And there's also, I guess, other ways around this problem by like not having references in Lambda that you want to store, but having some like shared point of things. Thanks. Um, so you had an example of a false positive because your analysis is assuming that there are no false control for parts. Right. Um, a very similar thing happens in um, our AIM times warning for use of uninitialized variables. <laughs> And we actually have quite a lot of experience with, with that now. What we found is uh, if you assume that all control flow paths are true, then for a lot of code bases, the false positive rate is unacceptably high. And so I think you'll find you need um, to be able to control whether you diagnose such cases. Okay, thank you for the input. Uh, all right, uh, thank you. This is amazing. Uh, I, I would use it two years ago. <laughs> Um, I have two, uh, one's a comment. Uh, your heuristics, I think, would greatly benefit by looking at Lisa Lippincott's work on the basic interface. Um, she gave an award-winning talk in Aspen a few years ago on this. I'm sorry for ruining the video uh, because me and uh, John Blakos uh, had way too many questions that we ran over by two hours. <laughs> but I think there's an acceptably long version on YouTube from the Berkeley user group. Um, so she did a lot of work on exactly what do we mean when we say nothing in the interface. Uh, and I think that implementing that, or at least consulting her, would be a very good idea. Because uh, she's been working on it for years. Um, I think she would also be very, very happy to see that someone can actually take her theoretical work and put it in a compiler. <laughs> uh, so actually, I think she'll be very happy to help. Uh, sorry, Lisa, if I... Uh, <laughs> um, and the, the, the second one, I guess, relates to, to Richard's um, uh, you will need flow analysis uh, comment. Uh, yes, you, you will. And um, I was wondering if, like, off the cuff, you know how much it would take to 
have the flow analysis that just depended on one known constant, uh, like a, an enum value that is constant to a function or a constant rule. Because a lot of the time, when I need flow analysis, thinking you know, uh, about the code that I write, usually I can have one branch and I can say, okay, I'm in this world now, this is true. And, but oftentimes, you will have this branch several times throughout the function because it's only in this world that I need this pixel. And I need it in five different places. And every other part of the code is the same, right? So this is like the most typical example. And if I had to just say, oh, I have this enumeration of worlds that I'm in. I can select which one at the start of the function. And then every if depends on that if one variable. That was already helpful. I think uh, one of the deliberate de design decisions was to have portable analysis in a sense that if different tools are implementing uh, this, they should have consistent warnings. So uh, different tool sets will have the same set of warnings on that certain code base and uh, that uh, in order to achieve that uh, for this kind of analysis, needs to be defined in a pretty rigorous way. So one way the portability is achieved in the paper right now is to keeping the analysis simple. And thank you for all the other input. I will look that up. Uh, uh, we said it's OK to dangle until we dereference and snap our necks. Um, I was wondering specifically about the case that you capture everything by reference to lambda and return that lambda. It seemed to me that at the time that you're analyzing that function that returns a thing with invalid references, you should be able to warn because it doesn't make too much sense to me anyway to return a function that can never be called. Yes, exactly. And that's what we're going to do, I think. So we said the reference is a problem, dangling not. But that does not, I mean, that's only inside a function. If we cross interfaces, then we don't want to have dangling pointers crossing interfaces because we will not be able to track anymore when this one will be dereferenced. So when we cross interfaces, we will always need to have non dangling pointers. So the compiler output output would show you on the uh, definition of that function where you made the mistake? Yes, in the return, there will be the warning. Just, just one side note, this is not special about lambdas taking stuff by reference. So if we have a lambda that takes a pointer by value, for example, and that pointer happens to point to something on that stack, that would have exactly the same behavior and it would be di diagnosed the same way. Sure. I suppose any object that stores a reference to anything right. the same problem. Right? All the same. Thanks. Hi. So I <clears throat> already had a little bit of discussion with Matthias about this, but um, so I've been working on this, something similar to this for the past nine months off and on uh, that would go into the type system itself and as an opt-in be part of the type system, um, which would solve, for instance, your translation unit boundaries problem uh, because you could propagate the analysis from one translation unit to another because it would be part of the signature. Um, several of the issues that I've been running into that, uh, you, you mentioned some of them, the, the extra and global variables are always a problem. Um, you mentioned exceptions that you haven't gotten there, which I actually think is gonna be potentially harder than you think. Um, and uh, so some of the other ones that I've run into, uh, when you get all the way down to a language feature that has to have issues, you would have to deal with, uh, Coroutines uh, go to is still in the language. Um, and uh, I said, oh, placement new is another one that gives you. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that, any thoughts on feasibility of something, putting something like this into something as rigorous as the C type system. So we have. Go to support actually in the implementation, even though it's not in the paper. I think the paper says you shouldn't do go to. <laughs> I think forward go to's are okay. Okay. And then what was the thing before go to? Exceptions. Exceptions, yes. Well, you already said exceptions. And placement. I mean, a lot of things like exceptions. Conceptually simple. You start and then things happen. We will see. Mm, yes. Also, having those annotations in the type system, I think that makes sense. 
but with our annotations, we are still discussing back and forth how they ex exactly would be spelled, where they should be. So I think that will take some more work. We can detect the mean point of contact, but the cost is very high. So I wonder if your analysis can show that certain local variables are 100% safe from being the mean pointers, and then if so, can you propagate this information back to back down to the backend? So I think right now there are no guarantees that we would catch all of the tangling pointers, but uh, I think that shouldn't stop us reusing this, these kind of uh, inputs from the analysis to aid dynamic analysis because maybe so maybe if you have a, re a very constrained uh, if you are very constrained at runtime, maybe it's still the best option you have at this point. But but of course it would be great to have something that actually gives you uh, guarantees as in a proved system, but uh, that would have very different set of trade-offs with the real world applicability for other use cases. So. So I, I, I believe this was a deliberate trade-off that we did not aim for catching all the problems. And this way, uh, we are more liberal what the user can write. So one thing you mentioned in answer to a previous question was a desire to have the same warning diffuse port vehicles implementations. I think that's a big mistake. Uh, I think implementations should be able to innovate uh, in this area and figure out what's best for their users and come up with better heuristics than whatever set we start off with. Uh, we found this across a number of other warnings where uh, time is matching and other implementations start off with and we find actually that, that warning is kind of terrible and there's a case of uh, class of warnings where we can tell there isn't a bug and we don't want to warn in those cases. So I think we should at least uh, not paint ourselves into a corner mm -hmm. saying we will make this Actually, I both agree and disagree. The Clang implementation does things that are not implied by the paper, but they are under a different flag. So, this kind of feature getting can, with this kind of feature getting, people can have both uh, innovation and portability, depending on what your needs are. Do we actually have time left? I think. Uh, yes, uh, may, maybe over. we should uh, give the. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's continue offline with the rest of the questions. Thank you a lot. Thank you.